possibly be more riveting subject to bring everybody out of the holiday drag, and you know what I'm talking about, than Major League Baseball's luxury tax. Good morning to you, I think. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dayon Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Penguins that are guaranteed to be more entertaining than this episode because I'm going to seize one of several opportunities this offseason to right some wrongs, meaning to attach actual facts to misperceptions. One of them, and it's a whopper in the world of baseball, is the luxury tax. I don't know where the notion came from that the luxury tax makes it down or trickles down to teams like the Pirates because it's just not true. The NBA has a system called the luxury tax in which that's the case. Maybe that's where people get this idea. Regardless, it's not true. The day before Christmas, when I really should have been finding better things to do than to read up on the latest Major League Baseball luxury tax news, MLB put out the list, the full list of the eight teams that will be paying into the luxury tax in 2023. The total amount of money that's going into it is $209.8 million dollars. So most people who would be interested in this sort of thing would see that headline and say, there goes $209 million to the Pirates and the Royals and all the other poor teams. In fact, that's not how it works. But before I get to that, the teams that paid into the $209.8 million luxury tax, half of that came from the Mets. $40 million of that, remarkably, came from the Padres, who had to take out a loan that was $10 million more than that in midseason just to make it through. But setting aside the stupidity that goes into this, here's what actually happens with that money. The first $3.5 million out of that two hundred and nine goes to funding player benefits. The next $103 million goes toward funding individual player retirement accounts. So we've already gotten half of that money out of the mix. The other 103, this is the last remaining $103 million, gets put into what's called the Commissioner's Supplementary Fund. And it gets distributed among revenue-sharing recipient teams who have grown their non-media local revenue over a predetermined number of years. If that sounds like a lot of mumbo-jumbo, here's what it means. If you're a team like the Pirates or the Royals or the Reds or the Brewers or whoever, and you've shown that you're making an effort to grow your local revenues, that almost always means attendance. Because as it says here, it means non-TV, non-media. Then you're eligible for some portion of this fund. Also within the commissioner's discretion here is to use part of that fund toward growing the game internationally. What part of all of this money goes to any of these initiatives never becomes known. But what is known is what the dollar figure is. The entire amount is 103. So if you just count up the number of teams that receive revenue sharing, and that's half of them, you're now taking that 103 and you're dividing it by 15. But it's actually less than 103. So the figure that ends up going out is around 6 million bucks, which is I'm sure not something that any team, including the Pirates, are going to send back to Major League Baseball's offices and say, no, thanks, we can do without this. But it's six million bucks. It's the equivalent of a good relief pitcher. And this, my friends, is what I mean when I say that a lot of the narratives that get put forth by the Major League Baseball Players Association, by their sycophants, 
in the agent community, in the national baseball media, this is the kind of stuff that they ride. They say the luxury tax, it's all being paid down to these teams that do nothing other than stuff that money in their pockets and all those other evil things. That's what they portray. They never give you the numbers. They never give you the information that I just did, which incidentally comes directly from Major League Baseball and the Major League Baseball Players Association. Okay, I'm not guessing at this. This isn't original reporting. It's available absolutely everywhere. But they don't tell you this part because it doesn't fit. It doesn't make yay happy day that Shohei Otani went to the Dodgers along with every other player. Now, there are other forms of revenue sharing. I want to be careful to stress here. There is a thing that's just called revenue sharing, and that's the big check that gets spread around, not to a few teams, but to all 30 teams. Some get more than others based on a pre-existing model and based on a pre-existing and known percentage of overall revenues. Those figures also do not get released, but my understanding in the past has been that the Pirates get somewhere in the range of $40 million a year when it comes to that. Now, does that make a difference? Sure. Meaning within your own local budget. Does it make a difference against other teams? No, because everybody's getting some. Even the Dodgers get their share, for example, of all of the national TV monies, all of the national satellite radio monies, all of the national advanced media or internet monies. The Dodgers get the same amount of that that the Pirates do. So your separation is nil. Now, I'm going to stop here because I know that I can never have a conversation like this with anybody without them thinking to themselves, he's defending Bob Nutting. Oh, my God. No, I'm not. Nutting doesn't spend what he should within the existing constraints. He really doesn't. I believe that he is excessively cautious. I believe that he is excessively cheap. But this notion that they sit on these hundreds of millions of dollars and whatever else, at least, at least before you say something like that, find out what those numbers really are. They aren't extravagant. When we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern. That's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of... Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Your front door, your car, your bike, your computer your gun. Safety is a habit. Every day you lock and secure your home and everything you want to keep safe. Gun safety and responsible storage are no different and the best way to help prevent accidents, misuse, and theft. If you have a firearm, own it, respect it, and secure it. Visit projectchildsafe.org. Brought to you by the National Shooting Sports Foundation and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Today's J1Q comes from Paul, who says, DK, keep preaching on this salary cap subject, but I have a question. Why did Bob Nutting vote in favor of this last labor agreement? Why didn't he even say a word during negotiations? Because I think it's a cartel and small market owners are the most complicit in this. They are the majority and could have the loudest voice. Paul, all kinds of issues with this question. In fact, I'm not even sure where to start, but maybe it should be with affirming that yes, Nutting did vote for this. And no, I don't like that he voted for this at all. I've brought it up with him. I asked him how, if he feels a certain way, and I know for a fact that he does, and strongly, he could just go along with the rest of them. The explanation that I received in return, and I've reported this, 
is that if you're an owner, any owner, whether you're a Steve Cohen or a Bob Nutting or anywhere in between, and you don't go along with the gang, you're going to get ostracized. You're going to get punished. You're going to not have your complaints heard in the future, your voice heard in the future. And based on some stuff that happened with the Rays not that long ago, I believe him. Because not so long ago, it was the owner of the Rays, Stuart Sternberg, taking one of these types of stances. And sure enough, when he thought he'd achieved some kind of deal where the Rays could split some of their season between St. Petersburg, Florida, and Montreal, the owners came down crashing on him because they were angry with him. Everyone remembers that. Again, I'm not sharing inside info here. That was a pretty big deal when it occurred. And Sternberg learned right away, you can't tick those guys off because they won't have your back the next time you need it. And that's not a big revenue versus low revenue thing. That's across the board. Another thing you mentioned in your question was that Nutting wasn't vocal during the last set of labor negotiations. And you're right when it comes to speaking publicly. That's because, again, all the owners tell all the other owners to shut up so that the owners can speak through a single voice, meaning that, of course, of Rob Manfred, the commissioner who they pay, and allow there to be no mixed signals. Not one guy over here says this, another one over here says that. It's all just whatever Manfred said. Behind the scenes, and again, I'm not guessing at this, Nutting was involved with a lot of different owners, not least of whom were some of the biggest revenue owners in baseball. So when you hear me say things on this program like, I really believe that this can happen or that can happen related to a salary cap, this is a lot of what I'm basing it on. Because I've been told about some of these conversations that have occurred. I've been told about the tenor of those conversations, about the purpose of those conversations. And there's not much daylight between the largest revenue and the smallest revenue teams on these types of subjects. That's pure fantasy. And in fact, if you go back over the way salary caps were achieved in the NFL, but especially in the NHL, the teams that ended up wanting them the most were the ones with the most money. Anyone who followed those stories can back me up on this. In the NFL, there was one rogue. That was Jerry Jones of the Dallas Cowboys. In the NHL, there were pretty much none. The charge was led by the owners of the franchises with the most money. The owners of the Rangers, the Red Wings, the Bruins, the Canadians, the Maple Leafs. They were all on board with this, a hundred percent. And my goodness, you'll never guess why. That's right, because they knew how much more money they'd keep in this system. As the old Grey Poupon commercial used to have as a catchphrase, when the zillionaire guy was portrayed as being a real penny pincher, how do you think he got to be so rich? I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We will do another one of these tomorrow. 